Come and play with us at the Toon Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Come and play with us forever and ever and ever. October, October's scary, October's very, very near, if you feel fear, October, scary story event. This is volume one, number three, page 88. I am... Wretched Rish Outfield. And I am Baleful Big Anklevich. <coughs> and he is rotten, R O 8 O T. Tonight's October scary story is Halloween in July by Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson. <sighs> All right. Kevin Anderson wanted it known that he doesn't own a single cat. Beyond that, he has published over 60 stories in magazines, websites, books, and podcasts of much higher quality than ours. He sent us a list of interesting facts about himself, which make me want to buy another story from him so I can share more of them. For example, he got married on Halloween Day. He doesn't care for clowns or rodents of unusual size. He can name all the original Saturday Night Live cast members. He keeps a shillelagh, baseball bat, short sword, and wooden stake next to his bed. And most importantly, he doesn't own a cell phone, and hence will still be alive when you and I are quite dead. Halloween in July by Kevin Anderson Alex and Sarah stood in the middle of their new home on a warm summer evening. A million miles from New York, their careers, invasive family members, and painful memories of the miscarriage. A fresh start, Alex said, placing a hand on his wife's belly. It's just what we need. Sarah nodded, smiling. I'm anxious to make this place look homey, Sarah said, looking around. When is the furniture arriving? Tomorrow. Early, I think. Alex slapped the stairwell with an open palm. But for tonight, we're going to rough it. There's a bed upstairs, circa 1900, and a few chairs. We'll be fine till morning. I know we will. Hey, what? Is something burning? Burning? Alex raised his brow. I assumed you were cooking. Hey... Well, it wouldn't be the first time you've used the fire alarm as a timer. True, Sarah conceded, sniffing the air. Where's it coming from? Not sure, Alex said, looking around. The smell of wood-burning smoke was distant, but intense enough to make him think they should be able to locate the source, quickly. They walked both floors of the old farmhouse, finding nothing smoldering or any signs of smoke. Alex stuck his head out the back door and was relieved. Finding Sarah in the kitchen, he said, It's outside. There must be a fire somewhere down the road. Let's close up the house and not let any more in. Jeez, it's going to get hot. It's the middle of summer. We'll turn on some fans. It'll be okay. Alex headed upstairs, moving from room to room, shutting the windows. Underfoot, the wood floors squeaked with age, and he loved the ancient sound in these old homesteads. It reminded him that they were in a real place, built by hand, and no longer in the prefabricated, manufactured suburbs where they wasted so many years of their lives trying to make a family that just wouldn't come. Heading back downstairs, he paused midway, seeing Sarah standing in the front doorway, holding the screen open. Honey? Alex said. Sarah glanced back, confusion on her face. Did you hear that? Hear what? I I swear I heard a knock, and and just before I opened the door, someone said, Trick or treat. Trick or treat? Alex scoffed, descending the rest of the stairs. I swear, 
Sarah insisted. And, and someone was here. How do you know? Sarah pointed out at the porch, and Alex stepped around the door, seeing a pumpkin about the size of a human head, resting on the welcome mat. Huh, Alex managed, scanning the front yard. They owned twelve acres, and there wasn't another house or structure visible. Strange, I don't see anybody. Sarah bent over, picked up the pumpkin. Where do you get one of these in July? Well, this is a farming community. Maybe it's some kind of small-town welcome. I prefer flowers. Maybe you could make a pumpkin pie, Alex said, shutting the door. Sarah raised an eyebrow. From scratch? You said you wanted to be more domestic. Not that domestic. Sarah moved off toward the kitchen, but a soft knock at the door stopped her in her tracks. Alex pulled the door open slowly, stepping back. Trick or treat, a small girl said, standing where the pumpkin had been moments before. She held out a dirty potato sack and was dressed as a clown, but not a modern, brightly colored one. She looked more like a hobo clown, face painted sad, baggy worn clothes, the kind reminiscent of vaudeville. Alex leaned on the door, perplexed. Trick or treat, she repeated. Sarah joined Alex at the door. Where are your parents, sweetie? The girl held the bag up higher. Trick or treat! Alex started to feel impatient. We don't have any treats right now, and it's July. You're a little early. Now why don't you run along home? The girl lowered the bag slowly, scowled, and stamped her foot on the porch. Trick or treat! Bloody feet! Give me something sweet to eat! Look, kid, I don't know what your game is. But I'm going to shut the door. Now run along home. Alex closed the door with a click, shaking his head. Shouldn't we ask her in, Alex? It's dark out. Well, she'll be fine. Country kids are tougher than regular kids. Sarah chuckled. <laughs> Where'd you read that, Tom Sawyer? Huck Finn. She'll be fine. Another knock shook the door, sounding as if it had been kicked. Sarah and Alex exchanged glances, neither of them able to comprehend the gall of the young country girl. Alex pulled the door open fast, anger rising, ready to scold the child. He was about to shout something, but instantly swallowed his words, shocked to see that now there were two kids on the porch. A boy, a few years older, face painted like a skull, stood shoulder to shoulder with the girl, identical potato sack thrust out. Trick or treat! the kids said in unison. Alex took a deep breath, <sighs> letting his anger fade a bit, then addressed the boy. As I told your little friend, we don't have any treats. Trick or treat, the kids repeated. That's enough. Please get off my property or I'm calling the police. Alex had had enough. He slammed the door shut, hard. The slapping wood echoed throughout the house, and Alex felt confident that that would be the end. He even started to walk away until he heard the unsettling sound of the children beginning to chant. Trick or treat, bloody feet, give us something sweet to eat. If you don't, we will cry, then we'll come and make you die. <laughs> Mild anger was evolving into rage, and Alex wrenched the door open. Three children now stood on the porch, grinning, empty potato sacks held out. The new one was a lanky girl, face painted green, pointed black hat drifting askew. Trick or treat, they said. Alex stepped forward, looking as if he'd grab one of them. The kids screamed, spun on their heels, and sprinted off the porch. Alex, Sarah shouted. They're just kids. Alex looked at his disapproving wife. I wasn't going to hurt them. I just wanted to... His words trailed off as he looked back outside. Jeez, where'd they go? What? Sarah said, stepping onto the doorway. It's dark, but I should still be able to see them. They ran toward the road. Sarah poked her head out and looked around. Well, they're gone now. I'm going to put Mr. Pumpkin in the kitchen, then get ready for bed. You coming? Alex stared outside, scanning over the yard. The smell of a wood-burning fire was so intense, he could almost see the flames flicker on the horizon. No, I think I'll ring the police and report this, 
They didn't look dangerous, Alex. Besides, the phones aren't on yet. Alex pulled out his cell, flipped it open. Just in case they vandalize the property, I want to get a report in. I got this. You go on, and I'll see you upstairs. After calling information for the sheriff's office, he finally got connected. But instead of the sheriff, he was sent to the town's main operator. Operator, how may I connect your call? A cigarette-marred female voice said. Yeah, I'm trying to reach the sheriff's office. Oh, you might be plumb out of luck. Busy night. I'll see if anyone picks up. Where are you calling from, sir? Uh, the Baker Homestead. Oh, how do, Tom? Didn't recognize your voice. Hey, when'd you get a phone out there? Uh, I'm not Tom. We just moved into... Hey, we got someone to pick up at the sheriff's office. I'm putting you through now, Tom. Happy Halloween. What? There was a double click, and then a new voice came on the line. Male, old, and impatient. Sheriff's office. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Newberry, and I'd like to report some kids knocking on my door. That's not a crime, Mr. Newberry. Yes, but it's dark out and... Alex lowered his voice as if he were about to deliver a secret. I, I think there's something wrong with them. How is that, sir? Well, they keep saying trick or treat, like they expect me to give them candy. <sighs> there was a deep sigh on the line. Well, that is how it generally works, sir. They say trick or treat, and you give them candy. Unless you want your window soap, I suggest you give them some, and they'll go away. Now, if there isn't anything else, we're very busy tonight. Yeah, but don't you think it's a bit strange? Kids begging for candy is the least strangest thing about Halloween, sir. Now, good night. The line went dead. Mystified, Alex was ready to hit the redial button when he heard little footsteps on the porch. The kids were back and chanting again. Alex became furious. He ran to the door, flung it open, and rushed out onto the porch. He couldn't see them but followed the chanting, which seemed to harmonize with the wind and rustling trees, sounding almost like singing. Finally, he spied their painted faces, one on top of the other, peering at him from around the corner of the house. He bolted after them, screaming, Get away from my house! He turned the corner, seeing them disappear behind the back, their singing amplified in the darkness. Alex wasn't in sprinting shape, and his heart began to pound as he ran through the backyard. Clutching his chest, he turned the corner and chased them around the front. Breathing heavy, Alex pursued them across the front porch and back around the house again. The children just laughed and sang as if it were all a game. Alex's rage boiled over, but his body was rebelling against his efforts. Cramps seized his chest, and every breath became painful. <coughs> he walked back to the front porch, thinking he might just wait there and catch them coming the other way. But after a few still moments, he realized he couldn't hear them running anymore. He could still hear the singing, but it seemed different. He couldn't tell what direction it came from. Then he noticed he'd left the door open, and that the singing came from inside. Jesus! Alex darted in, his panicked eyes searching. The singing stopped, instantly replaced by calls of trick-or-treat echoing around the house. He spun in a full circle, trying to find its origins. But it seemed to scurry around like frightened rats. Then the house fell silent, with a suddenness that made Alex's heart skip a beat. Oh, Sarah, Alex thought. Where is she? He ran to the stairs and called. Sarah! There was no answer. Taking the stairs two at a time, he sprinted upstairs, legs aching, heart pounding. Sarah! He hit the second floor and headed toward the hallway. The master bedroom lay at the other end. Its door was open and soft yellow light spilled out onto the hall floor. He called again. Sarah! No response. Just the echo of his own voice. Dread washed over him as he staggered toward the bedroom. Sarah! Other doors in the hallway slammed shut as he moved past creating a tunnel of darkness in his way. He reached the bedroom and stepped into the light, the door closing behind him. Instant relief swept through him. Seeing his wife sitting in the middle of the old springboard mattress, she sat cross-legged, 
back straight, hair up in a bun, wearing a long, ankle-length, soft white nightgown that he'd never seen before. Sarah, are you... Alex froze, catching sight of what rested in her lap. Orange and round, Sarah held the pumpkin next to her belly, caressing it lovingly with one hand and running the stainless steel tip of a carving knife around the stem with the other. Her eyes seemed sullen and joyful at the same time, almost exactly the way they did during her breakdown after the miscarriage. It's time to open it up, Alex. It's time to carve this precious one. What are you talking about? Sarah just grinned and looked at the door expectantly. Alex followed her gaze, turning to face the door. He could hear the children singing again, coming down the hall, getting closer, their tiny footfalls creaking the wood in the floor. And when it seemed the kids were right outside, Alex noticed they had added a new verse. Trick or treat, bloody feet, give us something sweet to eat. If you don't, we will cry. There was a knock at the door. Go ahead, honey. Answer the door. Alex looked back at his wife, seeing only a distorted reflection of the woman he loved fading back into insanity. It's okay, she said. There's nothing to worry about, babe. They just want to kill us. An echoing thump shook the door. Alex's chest hurt. He couldn't breathe. Slowly, he turned back to the door, reached for the handle, and turned. You the new sheriff? A thin deputy said, the stem of a grape sucker hanging on his lower lip. Kincaid nodded, removed his Stetson, and stepped into the bedroom, the wooden floor sounding off under his boots. I didn't think you started till tomorrow. I don't. Just in the neighborhood. Thought I'd get an early start on things. Kincaid said, glancing at the man's name tag. Well, what do we got so far, Deputy Foster? Well... The deputy pointed his pen at the two bodies on the bed. A man and a woman. This here is the Newberries from upstate New York. Moved in yesterday. Kincaid stepped around the bed, eyeing the freshly carved jack-o'-lantern, cradled against Mrs. Newberry's motionless belly. The deputy slid the pen behind his ear. The coroner and the fire marshal agree. It seems carbon monoxide seeped through a leak in a flue pipe from a gas-powered boiler in the basement. Gas leak, huh? Kincaid nudged one of the three potato sacks full of candy lying next to the bed with his foot. Uh, Seems so. Funny thing is, the leak wasn't that severe. If they'd had a window or two open, they'd probably been all right. The deputy pulled out his sucker and gestured with it toward the window. Can't reckon why they had the house all shut up in the middle of July. Hmm. What's with all the candy? And the pumpkin? The deputy shook his head. Hallucinations? The coroner said an oxygen-starved brain can wander a bit uh, towards the end. Kincaid was a good measure of people, and he felt his new deputy was holding back. You don't believe that, do you, deputy? Foster looked as if he'd just been caught stealing, and then gazed down at the bed. No, sir. Not at all. Well then, Deputy Foster, you have a theory? The deputy shrugged. It ain't so much a theory as history. Even before I was a kid, there's been odd goings on out here. Suicides, animal mutilations, disappearances. And I know it's impossible, but I swear pumpkins grow wild on this property. My granddad says it goes back before old Tom Baker even built this house. Kincaid smiled. Go on. In the 1930s, there was a Catholic orphanage on the property. It burnt down one Halloween night when the kids were lighting some candles for jack-o'-lanterns. A couple kids died. My granddad said people could smell wood burning for 50 miles, and some even say they could smell it years later. In any case, the whole area ain't been right since. Kincaid stepped over to the window and looked out over the desolate property. 
The view was magnificent, almost as spectacular as it had been the first time he'd enjoyed it, a couple of days ago when he'd broken in and punched a hole in the flue pipe. He loved old houses like this, large basement, deep closets, and very isolated. It met all his special needs. Trouble was, some couple from upstate New York swooped in and snatched it up before he got his offer in. But that was all taken care of now. The deputy's tone turned apologetic. Sorry, this ain't no kind of welcome to a new job, is it? That's all right. I think I'm going to like it here, deputy. Kincaid said, grinning, as he caught sight of three costumed kids sitting under a tree in the front yard. A little girl, face painted like a clown, met his gaze and waved. Kincaid was about to wave back, but caught himself. He then watched as the wind blew, bending the trees, rustling the leaves, and taking the children from view as they faded into a summer breeze. Author's note. The inspiration for Halloween in July came from an old-time radio show. I wish I could remember exactly which one. I listened to all the creepy ones when I was a kid. Lights Out, Inner Sanctum, uh, The Creaking Door, Outer Limits, anything I could find on the radio. But there was this one scene in a ghost story, at least I remember it as a ghost story, that has stayed with me for almost 30 years. There's this woman, and she hears a knock at the door. It's late, about 10 o'clock at night, so she's hesitant to answer. But when she does, there's a little girl standing on the porch. And the little girl never really does anything sinister. She just looks back up at her and says, Can Mary come out and play? I don't remember much else other than that there wasn't a Mary in residence. And for me, the scene has always been a reminder that put in the right setting, kids can be creepy as hell. You don't need a Damien or a Village of the Damned or even a Devil Times 5 cast to create something unsettling. Just an unattended child in the wrong place at the wrong time. I initially started writing this story for the Drabblecast in October of last year for their Halloween show. I wrote the first draft in such a rush that it had some major flaws, and Norm Sherman kicked it back to me in a few days pointing out the problems. The Drabblecast eventually went with another story for their last year's uh, Halloween 2008 episode, The Rat Bastards, but I still had time to fix this one up and get it into Doonesty for their October scary event story contest, not a contest thingy. I mentioned the Drabblecast uh, not only because it's one of my favorite podcasts, and I know the guys at Doonesty like it too, but uh, Halloween in July unintentionally turned out to be a prequel of a story that ran in the Drabblecast in 2007. It was uh, episode 36, Pumpkin Seeds, their first Halloween episode. Pumpkin Seeds kind of picks up a couple years down the road, and you kind of learn more about Sheriff Kincaid's special needs. Anyway, I hope you liked it. Happy Halloween. All right, then. We'll just move on, then. Right into the... All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the story. I certainly did. How about you? Do you enjoy the story, Rish? You're still angry over there, aren't you? About? You're just mad because he stole your idea, huh? <laughs> we'll talk about that later, right? Yes, we will. Um, I, as you know, I find children very scary. And I find <laughs> ghostly children very scary. So so good. Good on you, Kev. This was, uh, this was right up my alley. Yes, it was. So, hey, we got a lot of help on this one. That's right. I wonder how many times I do that in our shows. I don't know, but I'll be sure to cut it out. Yeah, we would like to thank Amory Lowe, Christine Maya Flares, Josh Roseman. Uh, Liz Mountainduski. Yes, and Liz Mirzievsky. All lent their voices to this production. They loaned their voices. They loaned them out. So if you loan something to somebody and they never give it back, did they steal it or did you just give it away? Hmm. Um, love is something if you give it away. I wouldn't know, Aruruti. Because, yes, love is a very alien word to me. 
Love is like a magic penny. Hold it tight, you don't have any. But lend it, spend it, and you'll have so many, they'll roll all over the floor. All right, O.T., I beg of you not to edit that out. I want our listener to know what kind of person Big Anklevich really is. I've spent too much time with children. I've, something that you continually mock me about is my fear of children. <laughs> but uh, obviously Kevin has something going on with that because, I mean, okay, the, the sheriff is clearly a bad person, but I'm still way more scared of these kids. Uh huh. Well, the kids are the ghosts. Although the sheriff is the one that killed everybody. No, that's what I mean. So at the end, are these children going to haunt the sheriff now? Or is the, is the sheriff in some way in league with? It seems like they were children? buds. You know, I'm not as much on the boat of being afraid of children as you are. Because I have children of my own, maybe, and I know that they're not really scary. They're just... One of them is. <laughs> they're just little guys. They're just doing their thing. And, the, and I was a kid once, too. Not me. I sprung fully grown from the mouth of Zeus. But, I don't know, this one just still kind of creeps me out. The, the kids, I, we'll have to see how the children did. When we recorded the uh, voices of the kids, we just had my kids, the Anklevich brood there, doing the voices of the children. Like I said, I, I know what kids are like. Kids, they aren't really scary. I mean, we, we have a little bit that we saved. We'll go ahead and play that bit. After you say, we'll come and make you die, you say, chop your head till you're dead. Soak you in a pool of red. I don't want to do that. That's me. <laughs> what do you say? Again? You're just a scary ghost. It's okay. I'll make you die. <laughs> no, somebody farted. I can smell it. Certainly, that's a different experience than I had my sister's kid record the lines. Yeah, she wanted it to be more vicious and more horrible than <laughs> that. And she's a chop off the old block, actually. He really likes creepy stuff, so. Yeah, didn't Did you? you take that kid to the Sweeney Todd uh, play? I did, and she, she has learned all these songs, which, you know, I'm a, a grown man, and those songs are hard to learn. <laughs> yeah, it's that kind of thing is really cool. Uh, this was the third of our October Scary Story events, which I asked people to submit way back in September, and uh, apparently we've only got one left. Yeah, a wonderful little piece by Alex Moisey. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be sorry to see him go. They're kind of our kids. They're all <laughs> grown up now, except for little Alex Moisey, and pretty soon he's, you know, he's going to get his braces off and... Going to knock up that girl and plays the flute in the band. and uh... Yeah, it'll be empty nest syndrome for us. It'll That's be right. sad. But there's always next October and a whole new crop. So thank you very much, Kevin, for your story. We thoroughly enjoyed it. He may say this in his outro, but if he doesn't, it's interesting with this story. This is a prequel to a story that he submitted to the Drabblecast called Pumpkin Seeds. Uh, the sheriff, the corrupt sheriff, Kincaid, that appears in this story, goes on to uh, get a little yeah. bit of reward for has, his evil doings. He has his own little adventure there. And yeah, I remember that. I think that was the first Halloween story that the Drabblecast ran, if I remember right. It's kind of become a bit of a uh, tradition now. It's Mer Lafferty for Christmas time on Skate Pod and Kevin Anderson for Halloween time on Drabblecast. And... The, the, it's Michael Stone with Clob every other month or so. Well, I, you know, you better get working on part three. It's interesting when a podcast starts to have racked up enough episodes that you get the same names, like we mentioned before, right? Uh, and you start getting stories in series. Yeah, I, I think that's really cool. And it's you know, we've we've been around for six months almost, not quite. Been so, around for longer than six months, my friend. Oh. We started in July. We're headed towards nine months. Can you believe it? That's just not right. Somebody should have put a stop to this a long time ago. Yeah, but we're in the third trimester now, so no, <laughs> no stopping can be done. Oh, dear. <laughs> Leave that in, Arroyo T. Let's get some hate mail. It's been a while. Okay, well, we, you know, we're still in the first year. Uh, if this thing lasts and we continue to tell the, the stories, who knows what kind of traditions that we can have. I, I certainly intend, if we're still around in October of '09, to do... Another group of October Scary Stories. Yeah. And uh, we said in a previous episode that we were going to announce what our contest event participatory thing was going to be for April. Maybe at the end of the episode, we'll talk about what we're, we've got planned. And hopefully that will give us enough time to actually plan something. <laughs> Maybe we should make it May. <laughs> June? But yeah, uh, so thanks, Kevin. 
for your story. It was really enjoyable. We're really glad that you sent it out to us. And if you have a story, if you're listening right now and you're thinking, I got a story that they would love, well, how would they get it out to us? Put it in the body of an email. Send that email to submissions at doonstief.com. We will look it over. And uh, if it's what we're looking for, you will hear it on this uh, very podcast sometime down the line. That's right. And do be sure to go by and check out our submission guidelines because uh, you got a better chance of making it if you've read those over and understand what we're after. And you also probably have a much better chance of making it if you listen to the show. I mean, if you're not listening to the show, then you're not listening. And so you're not hearing me tell you you should listen to the show. But... You know, that way you can tell what kind of stories we're actually after. Because you've heard the stories we take. That was kind of a useless thing that should be edited out. Uh, also, if you liked this story as much as we did, or you disliked this story in, in the exact opposite amount of how much we liked this story, we'll go to the blog page and leave a comment. Or you could even go to our Facebook page. We tend to have little comment threads that you can... Uh, check out you can add us as friends on yeah. facebook like i mentioned kevin anderson added us and uh, i'm gonna hold him to it someday it may be never but someday i'm gonna call on him someday you're gonna show up at his front door with a suitcase in hand going hey friend i need a place to crash man see i was trying to make it ominous that someday <laughs> and that day may never come well, you don't think I'm that's gonna call ominous on you. enough huh I would be scared to death if you showed up at my door with a suitcase in your hands. One other thing. We paid Kevin Anderson for this story. We pay our authors. And those payments are made possible by listener donations. That's right. It's kind of a pain to have to beg for donations every week. But we really do need money. And you don't have to donate a great deal. But it would be cool if you did. Yeah, we wouldn't turn it down. We've got a PayPal button right there on the website on dunesteef.com. You can click on that, pay any amount you'd like. If you really, really want to make our day, you can subscribe and donate $5 a month. Is it a month? Five a month or five a quarter, depending on what you like. Five a quarter, of course, works out to 20 bucks a year. Wow, that's a lot. No, it isn't. It's not very That's much. not a lot of money. It's not a lot for <laughs> the pleasure of keeping the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine rolling. And, you know, we were saying right before the show that uh, we have been working really hard to try and get more episodes out. And it, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's work to bring these stories to you, to edit, to get people to do voices. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun, but it is also, yes, a lot of work. And we just have certain things that we feel we must do, I guess. I don't know. We try and, and get other people to do voices. We like to have females actually do the female voices instead of us going, Hi! How are you doing? Because it sounds a little more realistic. We try and take it to the top level without going too far. And, uh, yeah, it does take some, some effort. So I don't know where we're going with that. But No, so if you enjoy what we do and you'd like us to be able to continue, please donate. And uh, if you're not able to donate, just tell other people about us or save one of our files and give it to somebody that you care about. And yeah. uh, maybe we'll get them to donate, all right? St I pressed the button. You know, I did wonder, and I mentioned it to you before, if it irritates listeners when uh, we do the female voices. On uh, Lonely Heart Club, you originally did the, the female lead part. Uh -huh. And when I was putting some of that together, I thought, well, actually, he sounds real good. <laughs> but we had already asked somebody to do the You're female part. for me, weren't you? <laughs> Look, there's nothing sexier than the, a chick with an English accent. Uh -huh. In my, um, hell, it's not an opinion. It is fact. fact. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I thought it was really cool. And, and then we had Emma do the voice, and it was genuine. Yeah. So it was great. But the voice for Maria, I did, and uh, we left that in. And yeah, had... Emma not been able to do it. I wonder if that would have bothered people that the two guys are doing the girl voices. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think people would be upset. I mean, most people have listened to other shows that just one guy reading the whole story, doing all the voices, whether they be female or male or the, the asexual characters or whatever, you know, they, they, they do the voices for them all. So I think people can handle it. I, I still think it was a wise choice, though, to cast Emma into that line. It's it's kind of hard. You know, you can do goofy girl voices and get away with it. But if you're doing the love interest voice, 
That just seems kind of weird. It seems like it's better if you have a genuine, actual female doing that. Well, I'll tell you what. If you're a listener and you would like to help us out with voices, just uh, send an email to editor at doonsteef.com and let us know that you'd like to do voices. Uh, also, if you'd like to volunteer in another way to edit stories, to read the submissions that come in, to provide music for the show. Hey, what did you guys think of that opening theme? <laughs> a kindly listener sent that in, and uh, uh, yeah, that, there's a lot of talent behind that. <laughs> Uh, one other thing that we wanted to do today, just recently, our friend Mike Bennett put out a new promo for his new podcast novel, Underwood and Flinch. Did I make that noise last time? I don't know, but I made it this time. How do you like that? Um, really like so that. while Rish goes to the bathroom and relieves himself, we're going to go ahead and play that promo. I'm just going to go in the corner because I want to hear the promo if that is <sighs> Oh, oh, okay, the, the cat's litter box is over there. You can use that. All right, take it away, Oedo T. For hundreds of years now, the eldest born male of the Flinch family line has become the faithful servant of the Lord Underwood in all his adventures and misadventures. <laughs> Unremarkable, perhaps, uh, but for the fact that for hundreds of years now, Lord Underwood hasn't been exactly human. Underwood and Flinch, a podcast novel from Mike Bennett, the thoroughly reprehensible author of One Among the Sleepless and Hall of Mirrors, Tales of Horror and the Grotesque. Subscribe now at MikeBeditPodcast.com or UnderwoodandFlinch.com. Master and Servant, Vampire and Guardian, Underwood and Flinch. All right, so there you have it. That was Mike Bennett's newest offering, Underwood and Flinch. Please do pop over there. Check it out. Hey, I peed in it, but I went a little bit of number two, too. That's fine. It's just... just... Go over there and push the, the stones. What do they call them? I'm sure I don't know. The, uh, the, the, the pebbles over the top of it, all right? That way it won't stink too bad and we'll be able to... Anyways, so if you like vampires, check this story out. You'll enjoy it. Hey, we haven't done any vampire stories on here, have we? I don't think so. Yet. You will. <laughs> Wait, what? Okay, so Halloween... In July. Yes, in March. We got all four seasons in one day here. I can think of the Crowded House song. How does the sting one go? Is that the one where he says that his daughter can be a fiend from hell? Yep. So this story kind of strikes home with you a little, does it not, Rish? It strikes home because I wrote a story just like it or because right. I'm afraid. You promised us a story. Once upon a time, there was a man named Dune Stiff. <laughs> He was born with no genitals. Oh, dear. But he sought genitals everywhere he went. He went from house to house knocking and saying, Excuse me, I was born without genitals. Do you have any that I might borrow? And of course everyone said no until one day. Yeah. Uh, Honestly, effeminate sound came <laughs> So, um, it was an interesting thing this week, getting Halloween in July ready and getting it all together, because... Rish actually edited this story this time around, and, and he, he found it strikingly similar to a story that he himself wrote earlier. We were just talking about that, and we thought we'd share a little along those lines about how things like that happen. No, when we first got this submitted way back in October, yeah, it struck me that a few years ago I wrote a story very similar to this, where there was a husband and he was forced to hand out candy to the trick-or-treaters uh, while his wife took the kids out trick-or-treating. And these ghostly children came to the door. And oh, they, they weren't ghosts. They were demons. Uh -huh. And they, were, they, they, they wanted bodies to inhabit. It's a good story. You know, it might have been the first story I wrote where the protagonist was a parent. Uh -huh. And it's weird. A lot of the stories I write now are adult in that way. And, and I relate to the adults, to the parents now, instead of to the <laughs> snot-nosed kids. It's just weird. Don't ever get old, kids. 
But uh, yeah, I, I read that and I was like, holy cow, this, there was a moment that was, I don't want to say exactly, but it was eerily similar to my story. And having written for most of my life, I found this phenomenon happens a lot. It really does. I don't know if, it, if there's just like some kind of large pool of ideas out there uh, and, and somehow different writers in different places dip their hands in and come out somehow with a, with the same or similar ideas. I remember when we were back in college and those commercials first started coming out, like that, that new technology came out where they would take the picture and they'd have like cameras all the way around. I think it was a Gap commercial or something like that where they first used it. And then in, in the Sting video, did they use it in the Sting video too? Let your soul be Let your, your pilot. Soul be your pilot. I, I remember the Gap commercial made it really a big deal. And then, of course, they used it in Matrix as well, where they would jump up and do their karate kick, and in midair, it freezes, camera angle swings over to the other side, and then it goes on. That whole freezing time thing became a really common thing that came out, and they started doing it in all the commercials, and they started doing a lot of movies, and I thought, wow, you know, when I was a kid, I always thought it would be cool to be able to freeze time and I, I remember talking on the phone with Rish, uh, and we were talking about ideas. We were thinking about writing some kind of a script where kids can freeze time and, and what they do when everybody else is frozen and, and they're running around being able to do whatever they want. And, uh, of course, as I normally do, I, I didn't write this story. I didn't do anything about it. And then a few years later, I was walking through the mall with my family, and came across a poster advertising movie coming up. And I went, oh, crap. I guess I'm too late now. I mean, I guess I'm probably not too late now because most people probably couldn't say, oh, yeah, it was that movie. Because, you know, I didn't really do a lot of business. But uh, the movie Clock Stoppers was That's on funny. the poster. I couldn't remember the name of it. <laughs> I knew Jonathan Frakes directed it. And I wanted to say Time Stoppers? Time Reasers? Time? Yeah. Yeah, Clock Stoppers came out. And I thought, oh, darn, I missed my chance. Somebody else got that idea first. I, I never saw it. I actually did see it. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great either. I think it's cool that you can be so pragmatic about that or that you can be so optimistic and not have that just tear you up. Because, <laughs> okay, I've got an, a, a, an experience to share, and that's totally like yours, where I, you know, I had moved out to L.A. to be a screenwriter, and I, I had this roommate, and he and I came up with this idea for some kids that go off to college and, you know, while they're doing the pledging for sororities and fraternities, it turns out that there's a vampire fraternity. And they hold initiations and all that. Uh -huh. And the ones that are chosen get to find out that these are really vampires and they get to prey on the other students and live forever, et cetera, et cetera. And so there ends up being a... Uh, Another group on campus, which is a, a, a vampire hunting group, to, to take these out. We came up with all these interesting ideas on that, and I, I started to write it. And, dude, it's a lot of work to write a script, as, as <laughs> yes. we've mentioned in other episodes. I'd say I was about 80, 85 percent done, maybe 90. I mean, all we had to do, basically, was the big confrontation, where those vampire hunters get together and, and do battle. And that was the end of the script that still needed to be written. And I hadn't come up with how we were going to kill the, the head vampire or any of that stuff yet. And the title of this script was The Brotherhood. Oh, wow, that's a good vampire And fraternity. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a name for the vampire fraternity. And maybe it's also a name for the group that comes together to battle the vampires. The, the, a close-knit uh -huh. group that meets on campus. So, almost done. And I went to a local video store I, right there on Pico in Century City. Looking at the new releases... And I just, I froze. I saw this movie. It, you know, it had a bunch of preppy looking vampires on the cover and it was called The Brotherhood. <laughs> and I looked on the back and it's like, you know, a young and naive girl moves to the big city to go to college and finds out there's a, a vampire fraternity formed on campus. Dude, oh, I just remember the color draining out of my face, <laughs> which is odd because I couldn't have seen my face at the time. And you, just, you became white like a vampire. I, yes. And my reflection disappeared in the video store <laughs> window. And I just, oh, I felt so terrible. And I just wanted to go home and, and throw away all this work that I had been doing. You know what the difference was? Why I was able to just let it go and you weren't? You actually put work into it. I just went, yeah, that would be a good idea. Maybe somebody should do that sometime. Uh, and I told Ian, uh, my friend, who had come up with the idea with me about it. And yet he, he didn't seem quite as bummed about it. I expected him... Because misery loves company, and I expected him to just be like, No! Why? And like I was. Uh -huh. 
And he was just like, you know, who cares? How close could it be or whatever? It's like, you and I both know that we made up this idea and we were not influenced by wh whoever wrote that or whoever made that. We had no knowledge of any of that. But I, oh, I became so paranoid and I started to wonder if maybe he had heard of this kind of thing and that had tainted our writing of it. And yeah, I sure as hell was not going to put forth the, the effort that was to necessary finish to finish up. this darn thing. But you know what? A, a little while passed and he said, no, you know, I know what we wrote is really good. And you know, you owe it to yourself to finish it. And he's like, forget about the brotherhood. Don't ever rent it. Don't ever pay it any other mind. And so, yeah, I did go and started work on it again. And, and I eventually finished the script and uh, never rented the brotherhood. But it's interesting because seven or eight months later, there was a Brotherhood 2 in the video <laughs> store. A Brotherhood 3. I believe there are four of them now. Oh, jeez. And I know I didn't rip off this idea. What was the story with Neil Gaiman? You were, you were checking out his blog or something like that. Tell me, tell me. That's right. Neil Gaiman, a book, a young adult, whatever you call that. He wrote a book. I, I hate it when people say it's a YA fiction, so it's not real. It's not. That's false. Or it's fantasy, so it's not worthy of <laughs> comparison with real literature. So he wrote a book called The Cemetery Tale, and I guess it was about a boy who's orphaned, and he goes to live in the cemetery, and he is raised by ghosts. And on his blog, he shared a link to a woman's blog where she was a writer, and she had come up with this idea a couple years before of a girl who was raised by ghosts. She lived in a haunted house, or maybe she even lived in a cemetery. When she heard about Neil Gaiman's book... It just broke her heart because <laughs> she knew that it's you know the feeling, it huh? could never happen. Or, or if she ever wrote this book, it would be tainted by the fact that Neil Gaiman wrote one like it. Or it would be forever compared to that. And we talked about in an earlier episode, me going into a pitch session for producers in Hollywood. And they love to dismiss your work as, oh, yeah, that sounds like Stir of Echoes. I'm like, no, no, it wasn't like Stir of Echoes. I, 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 I've never even seen Stir of Echoes or, or whatever, you know, it is, uh -huh. kind of thing. That they want to stamp right. a, it's just like, on there. Yeah, if, if they say that, you have to say, no, it's Stir of Echoes meets uh, Adam's Family. In college, we would always make fun of uh -huh. things like that. You know, it's Bed of Roses meets The Exorcist, which is a really dated reference, folks. And I'm sorry that I'm that old. Don't let it happen to you. Become a vampire. But Neil Gaiman, in this blog, I think he emailed this woman and he said, hey, you know, I heard what you said. Write your story. It's like, because I'm sure you'll write stuff that I didn't think of. Your characters will be different. It's ju just because they start from the same seed or they have one plot element in common, which of course seems like the major plot element. Uh, he says, I would love to read your story. He's like, don't give up, write it. Uh -huh. And, you know, it is kind of like clock stoppers. In 10 years or 20 years or whatever it is, chances are not a lot of people will remember the graveyard book. And if somebody makes a movie about a little girl that's raised by ghosts, you know, some people may yeah. say, yeah, okay, that's like the graveyard book. But other people will be like, holy cow, what a great idea kind of thing. You know, I, I, I'm too close to my script to know that if it were made as a movie, people wouldn't say, well, that just rips off Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Because, you know, how do I argue with that? But I, I thought that it was pretty good. Uh -huh. And you know what? How many vampire movies, or direct-to-video vampire movies, I, it's, whatever it is. I, I've started reading this, this book series, these Charlene Harris books about a, a, a woman who falls in love with a vampire. Is and, it, what, what, what's the name of the character? Suki Stackhouse. Ah, Suki. <laughs> and, dude, it's really, really cool. I've heard but, of another uh, series about a woman who falls in love with a vampire. I can't remember what it was called. It was something about like a time of the day or I don't remember. Yeah. Was it Anyways, called Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Maybe. or Once Bitten. But, but, but I'm just saying that, uh, okay, Twilight is out there and Buffy the Vampire oh, Slayer Twilight. is out there. And, and, you know, Anne Rice's romantic vampire stuff. And countless interpretations of the Dracula story where Mina and Dracula have something going. And yet the Suki Stackhouse books are, are totally compelling. And totally feels interesting and, and original to me. So, you know, I, I guess I should stop my hemming and hawing and, and, and say, you know, there's room out there for more than one vampire fraternity story. That's probably true. There's room out there for more than one spooky ghost Halloween trick-or-treater story. As we have proven... <laughs>
Well, I don't know. We haven't oh. put out mine on yeah, here. Yeah, I guess there's yours. But yeah, we we decided which one was the better one. And oh, we decided. Zing! Anyways, yeah, it's definitely the truth. And a clock stoppers movie written by me coming up in summer 2015. Yeah, that's going to be good to look forward to. And, uh, you know, it'll be called something different. People probably won't even link the two. But yeah, I now we're finally making our way to April. And this is something that we've actually done for fun. Uh, one time, way back when, I had this idea for a story. And I, and I thought I had to write this story. But I just, I'm so lazy as it is. I just couldn't bring myself to sit down and put the freaking effort into it. I was too busy having sex instead of putting in that effort. You poor guy. <laughs> and I just thought, gosh, this idea is good. What can I do to make myself write this story? And finally I thought, I know. What if I just send an email off to Rish? I just said, this is what's going to happen. I, I gave him a premise. You write your story, I'll write mine, and then we'll exchange them and just see how similar they are. And, of course... A month later, Rish had sent me his story, and I still hadn't started on mine. But the good thing about it was, it actually made me feel guilty enough that I finally sat down and I finally wrote my story. In between sexual <laughs> escapades, he found the time. <laughs> and so, yeah, I finally put in the F. Something that we've done three or four times since then, where we've just said, okay, we're going to do that again. Here's the premise. Go. And we both write our stories. We don't talk to each other about them whatsoever. I think the second time, Rish sent me the premise. And I said, oh, okay, well, how about this? And I sent him back basically my outline. And I was like, no, 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 and no, And no, he's no. like, oh, no, no. And he just didn't read it. Deleted it. Well, actually, he didn't delete it because luckily, like, a year later, I'm like, yeah, I, I need that outline back so I can actually do my story. There's, again, me being lazy and finally getting it finished a year after Rish was done. Well, dude, there's a lot of sex to be had. Apparently. I totally thrive on deadlines and assignments and need a fire to be lit under my butt to get the writing going and all that. Because it's uh -huh. far too easy to lay back and yeah. imagine who you're having sex with <laughs> and not write it's for me. It's easy to do nothing. It's, there's TV to watch. There's books to read, video games to play, sleep to be had. There's noses that need picking. There's just a lot of stuff that you can do instead of uh, uh, writing. And yeah, it's really easy to, to uh, avoid. And sometimes that really helps to have that. Uh, that same thing happened to me with the October Scary Story event. And I think I was late, if I remember right. I was like two weeks late. But I finished the story. And, which... and you had had that idea since high school, <laughs> am I right? Yeah. And because of this deadline, because of this pressure of this assignment, you wrote that story that had been percolating since high school. And me, I had an idea in 2006, and then suddenly we had that October 31st deadline. It's like, by Jove, I'm going to write that. <laughs> yeah, so that story, I don't think I ever would have written the one I wrote had I not had that deadline. Okay, so the point we were trying to make with this is April is coming up. We said that we would have some kind of event, some kind of contest because money is involved right i guess if you can call it money yeah if well, if, if people your, donate if you know. your story is chosen then it will be put on the show and you will get uh, the small nominal fee that we pay to our authors but big and i have been doing these story swapping things for a few years and uh, somebody coined the term broken mirror stories <laughs> where we both start with the same premise and we write a story based on that premise and I've really enjoyed the output. I've enjoyed comparing them, contrasting them. I remember there was one where you and I had like two of the exact same sentences in our story <laughs> somehow. And I just thought, wow, that's amazing that our minds both went there or decided to have those lines of dialogue or whatever it was. And there was the ones where we, our titles were almost identical. But yet, they're also so miles apart different as well. It's just really interesting to see where, you know, you have the same beginning point, but because you're two separate people, where does it take you? So that's what we're thinking of doing in April is the broken mirror, the April broken mirror event. <laughs> Next week, we'll have your premise. What we'll do is we'll just say, hey, that it starts on April Fool's Day. Mm -hmm. so we'll have like the April 30th deadline. And uh, if people would like to submit stories, we'll read them during the summer the same way that we're doing the uh, October Scary Stories right now. That's right. I'm excited about it. Now, we haven't discussed this between us yet. So uh, by next time when we announce what the premise is going to be, uh, we'll tell you whether we're going to participate or not as, as contestants. Maybe we could just sneak the stories into our slush readers and we'll put a fake name on there and have them read them and see if they like them. 
And if they say, I give that a two. Then they're fired promptly. <laughs> well, hey, this just sort of brings to an, a close our October scary story. But here we are in March, and it's a, an especially nice night. And so we had the, the window open. You can hear the wind <laughs> blowing. And Big lives out here on the, the peninsula of nowhere. <laughs> and in one direction, there are literally no neighbors. And that's where I grew up, too, is, is a place like that. Well, I mean, much, much worse than where you are. But sometimes when I come out here just to hang out or to do the podcast, you can hear coyotes out there <laughs> baying at yeah. the moon or, or yipping or, or doing whatever they, they want, do. tearing apart with small children. And there's something so cool about that, <laughs> that here we are in the 21st century, and yet there's also nature that close. Yeah. One time our cat, we accidentally left it out all night, snuck out the door when we were going outside at like 8. Didn't even think about it again until like 7 the next morning when I woke up and I look out the door and it's all sitting there at the sliding glass door just waiting for us to open the door up. I open the door and it runs in. And it's got like a scab on it. I wonder how many household pets become dinner for the coyotes. Because I swear they sound like they're just down the street sometimes. It's just really creepy. I love it. I, I love it, too. <laughs> and growing up, we had coyotes in our backyard, too. And when, it, you know, when you had to get up at 5 or whatever, you could see them out there running around and stuff. There's something really exotic <laughs> and cool about that. Am I wrong? Yeah. We're, we, we're, just, getting yeah. A new, we're just getting a new high school out here. And... Uh, they put out a contest. A, it was named the high school, but it was also pick the mascot. And I put in my uh, pitches. Let me guess, coyotes? No, it was actually devil worshippers. I say actually did put in coyotes and eagles because we can drive down the street and I can see a friggin' eagle just flying around. Uh, not bald eagles, unfortunately. We just get the uh, gold comb over. Eagles. But it wound up being the thunder. It's just <laughs> such a lame name. I despise sports nicknames that they're not a thing they're more like a concept we're the thunder not like the thunder claps or the thunder bolts or something you know you always have an s on the end because there's this team of the bears or the tigers rough riders <laughs> the saskatchewan rough riders <laughs> I, I hate teams like the jazz the heat or the thunder lame but oh well I guess that's what we get. No coyotes. You know, once the weather warms up, we'll probably start taking walks again where we walk around your neighborhood. And it wouldn't surprise me if in April or May we go out and on a particularly quiet night, you can hear the ghostly children out there <laughs> chanting. <laughs> All right, so that's our show for today. Thanks for spending this time with us. Thanks, yeah. I hope you enjoyed wasting an hour of your time with us. <laughs> And I, I enjoyed it. I don't know. I enjoyed I, it. I'll look back on this sometime, and, and I hope that I don't feel regret that we did this podcast. All right, so thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anglovich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Some places are like people. Some shine, and some don't. Good night. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. May I connect your call? Sorry. Harvey Firestein answered the phone. <laughs> a cigarette oh, I've got life. to call my lawyer. Now, what are we going to do with this? This is a female voice, but it's a cigarette marred female voice. We could probably get away with it. Hear me, I connect your call. That's just as bad as the Harvey Firestein voice I did. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Roz from. <laughs> right. I don't want to see any paperwork on it. Why haven't we seen a sequel to that? She should have like a country type voice, though, huh? Mm hmm. How may I. I can't do one of. Just voice. imagine Reba McIntyre. Just how, how may I connect your call? How may I connect your call? See, I can't do the cigarette mart thing we without can't. doing it with a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> How may I connect your call? Uh, 
Ew. Oh god, kinda of liquidy there.